Our reading tonight is from Matthew uh, chapter 26, verses 17 to 30. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one to have not been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He then took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, or to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my, for, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Tonight, we're going to hear the story of 12 ordinary men. Ordinary men who are just living their lives until Jesus entered their hearts. May they have chosen to follow him, learn more about his ministries, and carry out that ministry after Jesus has left this earth. The founding of the church and the spreading of the gospel depended entirely on these 12 ordinary men with their obvious weaknesses. God took the unworthy and molded them as Potter moves his clay. They were not brilliant writers or philosophers. They were not great teachers. They became all those things through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's listen as we hear their stories tonight. My name is Bartholomew. I was from Cana. Cana is very close to Nazareth. That's where Jesus was from, you know. Philip was my friend and we were often together. I studied the Old Testament and was anxiously awaiting the Messiah's arrival. I sat under a fig tree to study, study the scripture. Later I found out that Jesus knew that's where I went to read the Old Testament. He knew my location, but more importantly, he knew my heart. I had always searched for divine truths. Philip told me that he had met Jesus and believed he was the Messiah, the chosen one. Do you know what I said? I said, that can't be. Can anything good ever come from Nazareth? But Philip said, come and see, and I did. Luckily, my stubborn mind didn't keep me from going with my friend. But you know what? As soon as, soon as I met Jesus, I received Christ as the Messiah. I knew it was him. I was faithful. I was diligent and honest. But I was human. My response about Jesus being from Nazareth was not based on anything biblical. It was based solely on the fact that I was prejudiced. I had contempt for the people of Nazareth. I thought they were unrefined and uneducated. You know, prejudice is an ugly thing. It closes people's ears and hearts, and there are so many kinds of prejudice. Racial, social, religious, intellectual. The right way to deal with prejudice, I found, is to co confront it with facts. I admit I had sinful tendencies. I was such a skeptic. Fortunately, they didn't keep me from following Christ. You know, Jesus knew my faults. He knew I was human from the beginning. But he also knew that I was honest and sincere, and I was faithful to the end. I was living proof that God can take the most common people from the most insignificant places and use them for his glory. My name is Simon. 
I was a zealot. I was a political fanatic, a fighter for a cause. I had a fiery, zealous temperament. I thought that a new messiah would come and overthrow the Romans. You see, I struggled openly with the Roman rule in Palestine. I was willing to shed blood for my cause. I was friends with Judas. We were quite a team. We started following Jesus for political reasons. I thought he was the one that had enough power to help our cause. After all, I was there when he cleared the temple. Wow. Did he have a wild temper that day? I like that. So I decided to trade in my sword for the cross. Matthew and I began to work side by side. He was a tax collector, so he didn't have that many friends. But together we worked side by side to spread the gospel. You know, even though I started with Christ for the wrong reasons, I was transformed. I became a man of fierce loyalty to Christ. I had an amazing passion. I had courage. I had zeal. I only wish my friend Judas had been transformed as well. But sadly, that didn't happen. Christ used that fiery enthusiasm that I once had as a zealot and turned it into a passion for sharing my devotion to him with all those I met. My name is James. I was often referred to as James the Less because I was so young. Sometimes they even called me James the Younger. I was a small man, very quiet, and mostly stayed in the background. I kept a very low profile, and I liked it that way. I was a man of prayer. I spent a lot of time in prayer. I spent so much time in prayer that my knees became hardened like the hooves of a camel. I was a disciple of Christ. I liked what he had to say. You know, some people thought I even resembled Christ in looks. People even speculated that the night Jesus was in the garden, Judas planted a kiss on Jesus' cheek so that the soldiers would be sure to get the right man. My mother Mary was a developed follower of Jesus, too. She was one of the women that came to prepare Jesus' body for the for burial. She loved him so much. I was indeed one of the disciples, but I had no real significance in Christ's ministry. The world may remember next to nothing about me, but in eternity I will indeed receive my full reward. My name is Thaddeus. I was the son of James and the grandson of Zebedee, both well-known fishermen. I was young and I was looking for answers. I wanted to know life's truths. I wanted to find a good leader to follow that would help me make my life better for everyone. I knew Jesus was better. Jesus was that leader. But the world didn't know yet. That bothered me a lot. I once asked him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not the world? He knew my question was full of gentleness and meekness. I wasn't brash or bold like Peter. Christ explained that he would manifest himself to anyone who loved him. I understood what he meant. We all knew that he was King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but the world didn't yet. What he was trying to tell me was that he was not going to take over the world externally, but instead he was going to take take it over one heart at a time. Well, he sure touched my heart. I was a tender-hearted soul that followed my Lord to the end. I guess I'm proof that God can not only use zealous, but he can also use tender-hearted, compassionate, gentle, and sweet-spirited people like you. My name is Andrew. I was the first disciple to be called. Immediately, I said, I have found the Messiah. Peter was my brother. He was the outgoing one. I preferred being in the background. People often ask me if I was resentful of him, but I wasn't at all. As a matter of fact, I brought Peter to Christ. When I met Jesus, I was already following John the Baptist. I knew he wasn't the Messiah, so I left him and followed Christ, the true Messiah. I was eager to follow him, and I had a zeal to bring others to meet him. Sometimes they called me the usher, because I ushered so many people to Christ. I liked relating to individuals in one-on-one ministry. I had no qualms about inviting people to meet Christ. Jesus well, and I knew if someone wanted to meet him, then he would want to meet them. I was at the feeding of the 5,000. Actually, I was the one who personally worked through the crowd and talked with the boy who had the loaves and fish. I brought him to Jesus because I trusted him and knew he could bless this boy's small gift and make it great. I was comfortable in my obscurity, 
I had lived my whole life in Peter's shadow, so I was perfectly content to live in the shadow of Christ. Actually, most future pastors are a lot like me. They labor in relative obscurity as they bring others to Christ. Even now, most people don't come to Christ through a sermon they've heard, but rather through the influence of an individual. Effective leaders don't always have to be in the limelight. When you speak, speak the truth, and when you act, act the right way. So always remember, just because you can't speak in front of a group doesn't mean that you don't have leadership gifts. All you have to do is befriend one person and bring them to Christ. God's ability, ability to use a gift is not hindered or enhanced by the size of the gift. I hope my legacy is this. Little things count. Individual people are significant. Small gifts can be blessed by God, and service can be inconspicuous. My name is Matthew. I was well-educated and wealthy. I didn't have many friends. You know, I was a tax collector. People didn't like me because of my job. After all, I did have to strong-arm some of my townspeople. They never really tried to get to know me as a person. But that all changed when I met Jesus. One day, I was just sitting in the window of my office, and Jesus walked by. He looked me in the eyes and said, follow me. I don't know why, but I stood up and followed him. I just stood up and followed him. That wasn't like me at all. I even held a banquet and invited everyone I knew to meet him. The banquet hall was full of low lights because, honestly, they were the only people who would associate with me. Later, after I worked with Jesus so much, I wrote one of the Gospels in the Bible. I was able to quote him a lot because we spent so much time together. I was always a loner, but somehow I couldn't be anymore. I needed to be with him. I knew the Old Testament, but I was spiritually hungry. I yearned for the truth. I found it in his words. You know, I am proof that Jesus takes the most despicable men and redeems them. He gave me a new heart and used humble, shy me in a remarkable way. My name is Judas Iscariot. I will always be remembered as the traitor. But come on, I was just fulfilling the prophecy. I did betray him for 30 pieces of silver though. I started with Jesus just like the other 11 disciples did. I was the treasurer, and I have to admit that sometimes I helped myself to some of it. I just never grabbed on to the faith like they did. They grew in their faith and I became more and more of a child of hell. I continued to follow him even though it got harder and harder to do. You know, it was kind of strange. I had just as much potential as the others, but I never really embraced Jesus' teachings. I was progressively disillusioned. I was a young patriotic Jew. I didn't want the Romans to rule. I wanted Christ to overthrow the government. I wanted to gain some monetary reward for giving up all those wasted years. I spent three years with him and my heart only grew hard and hateful. I became a secret outsider. But Jesus knew that. He knew that I would be the betrayer. But he would call me to be a disciple anyways. I never quite understood that. I took those 30 pieces of silver, planned to betray him, and then quietly slipped back in with the others and pretended that nothing had happened. Then we went up to the upper room for a last dinner with Christ. Jesus brought out a basin and towel. He began washing our feet. He was serving us. I thought we were supposed to be serving him. He even washed mine. Then we began dinner. Jesus announced that one of us would betray him. The others were shocked, not me, of course. He had masked me in front of the others. It was time to act. I began making arrangements while they were eating. I left and told the soldiers where they could find him. It wasn't a sudden impulse. It was planned. I went to the garden. I kissed him. I turned him in. After that, I couldn't stand the guilt. I wasn't sorry that I betrayed him. Instead, I was sorry that it didn't make me feel as good as I thought it would. I didn't seek forgiveness. I didn't ask for mercy. 
I was as close to Christ as I could be. I enjoyed every privilege of knowing him. I knew all of his teachings, but yet never, I never believed. So I sold my soul to the devil. There are lessons to my life. One is the tragicness of lost opportunity. I heard his words, but they never connected for me. I was given a lot of privilege and I squandered it. I loved money and that love was the root of all evil. But on the other hand, I was proof of the patience, goodness, and loving kindness of Christ. Because in spite of all of this, he called me his friend. My name is Philip. I was a fisherman by trade. I was very practical minded, a process person. I loved facts and figures. I was a bean counter. I was meticulous and I loved studying the Old Testament a lot. I had been a follower of John the Baptist and one day I met Jesus. I was mesmerized. He was such a charismatic speaker. I believed his words right away. When you become a believer, your first is instinct is to tell a friend. Well, I couldn't help but go and tell my best friend Bartholomew. That wasn't like me. My natural tendency was to hold back, doubt everything, ask questions, wait and see. But it wasn't that way with Christ. I jumped right in. My job was coordinating things. I was in charge of acquiring and distributing meals. I made sure Jesus and my friends had meals when they were hungry. Well, I was with Jesus the day when he was preaching to the 5,000 followers. The crowds were hungry and didn't want to leave. Jesus asked me, how do you propose to feed these people? I think it was a test for me from Jesus. He knew I was analytical. I couldn't figure out what to do. I counted heads and worried about what to do. Everything seemed impossible to me. I was indeed a pessimist. I didn't understand the limitlessness of Christ's power. It escaped me. My friend Andrew found the boy with the loaves and fishes. He knew that Jesus could make that work. I envied that. In our last meal together in that upper room, Jesus was saying goodbye to us all. He told us, if you have known me, you have known my father. He was trying to tell me that he and God were one, but I didn't get it. Stupidly, I said, show us the father and it will be good for us. Show us the father? What was I thinking? I had really missed the point. Jesus answered, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you ask me that? You have seen the Father. I was so embarrassed, so human. For three years I had looked into the face of God and I didn't get it. I was a man of limited ability, a man of weak faith. I was imperfect. But all that was okay because Jesus was perfect and his strength was made perfect in my weakness. My name is Peter, who was probably the oldest disciple that Jesus called. One day Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and he saw my brother Andrew and I casting our net into the sea. And he stopped and said to us, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Interesting enough, we both immediately dropped our nets and joined him. I was very outspoken and often spoke for the disciples, whether they liked it or not. I was kind of the unofficial leader of the group. I was eager and bold. I was aggressive and outspoken. Often my mouth would rev up and speak while my brain was still in neutral. I would jump into things but bail out before a project was complete. They often teased me about being the first one into a task and also the first one out. I made big promises I couldn't keep. I had the potential to be a good leader, but I had a lot of flaws that got in the way of my leadership abilities. I had a quick temper. I bet you heard the night in the garden I was mad, really mad as they tried to take Jesus away. I reached for my sword and slashed one of the soldier's ears. 
But Jesus wasn't mad. In fact, he stopped to heal the soldier's ear. I did not have that kind of self-control at all. Jesus nicknamed me The Rock as my leadership in his ministry group. I liked that nickname, but when Jesus called me Simon, it was his way of correcting me. He was reminding me that I was returning to my old ways and that I should correct my behavior. When he called me The Rock, he knew I was behaving as Christ wanted me to. At the upper room, Jesus got a basin and cloth and began washing our feet, just like a servant would do. I was upset. The other sat and didn't say anything. I said, No, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. He said, Okay, but if I do not wash you, then you have no part of my ministry. That surprised me because I definitely wanted to be a part of his ministry. So I replied, Fine, but don't just wash my feet, but also my hands and head too. I wanted him to know that I was committed. I know, I know once I denied knowing him, but that was certainly a lapse in judgment. Those were scary times, and I wasn't thinking clearly at all. I regretted that mistake for the rest of my life. So people ask, are leaders born or are leaders made? I think I was born with innate gifts, but I needed someone like Jesus to shape me into real leadership material. I was inquisitive. I had initiative. I was involved. I possessed all the raw materials I needed, but it was the Lord that trained me and shaped me. Quite frankly, raw material like mine, if not submitted to the Lord's control, can be downright dangerous. This verse summed up my life. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what I do. My name is James. I was the big brother of John. Jesus called us the sons of thunder. We think it was because it defined our personalities. We were zealous, thunderous, passionate, and fervent. I was very passionate. My family was very wealthy and prestigious. Ironically, I might have been the logical choice to be the leader of the group of disciples, but Peter was a stronger leader, so I took my place as second in command. I was in the inner ring of disciples. It was Peter, John, and I. We often accompanied Jesus as he worked on his ministry. I was with him when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. I witnessed firsthand Jesus' power and glory. I was with him in the garden and saw his agony. Both of these events strengthened my faith immensely. I mentioned earlier that I was passionate. I was a man of intense fervor and intensity. My style stirred things up and I made enemies quickly. Jesus reminded me that there is a legitimate place in spiritual leadership for people with thunderous personalities. But Jesus' example taught me that loving, kindness, and mercy are virtues to cultivate just as much as righteous indignation and fiery zeal. Christ trained me to be on the front line as his gospel advanced and grew. He taught me to temper my passions with sensitivity and grace. I learned to control my anger and bridle my tongue. I learned to redirect my zeal and eliminate my thirst for revenge. I lost my self-ambitions and turned myself over to him. He changed my life. My name is John. I have been a follower of John the Baptist. Jesus called me to follow him, and we became close friends. He taught me how to love. I am often referred to as John the Beloved because I had a gentle spirit. When I stood at the cross and watched all the horrible things they did to him, he looked over at me and said, John, take care of my mother. That's exactly what I did. I never left Jerusalem or Mary for the rest of my life. That was the least I could do. I was indeed in the disciples' inner circle, but I really liked being in the background better. I was not a dominant person at all. I left that control to Peter. He thrived on it. Don't get me wrong, I was often volatile and brash. I've been known to be passionate and zealous too. The disciples thought James and I had similar personalities. We were both 
personally ambitious, but all those liabilities became some of my greatest assets. I had a zeal for truth. My thinking was very black and white. There were no gray areas in my life. I like to draw a clear line between absolutes and opposites. But sometimes my zeal for truth lacked love and compassion for people. I needed to learn balance, and that's where Jesus came in. He taught me that. I learned to be humble, loving servant, and I owed it all to those two little words, follow me. This Thomas, you probably know me better as the doubter. I was a good man, but I was very strong, but very negative. I was always anxious and a worry ward. I was indeed a pessimistic brooder. I always anticipated the worst. I was devoted to Christ almost as much as James was. When Christ was with us, he kept talking about dying, and I didn't like to hear that. If Christ was going to die, then I wanted to die. I didn't want to live without him. But, as you know, my worst fear did come true. Jesus died, and I didn't. I was alone. I felt betrayed and rejected. It was over. My heart was broken. I wanted to brood. I wanted to be alone. While I was brooding, though, the other disciples said that they had seen Jesus. I couldn't believe it when they told me. I refused to believe it. I told them, until I put my finger in the print of the nail on his side, or unless I see the print of the nails in his hands, I will not believe. I did doubt their word, but don't be too hard on me. The others didn't believe until they saw Jesus. They were just lucky. They were all together when he appeared. I wasn't there, so it was a little harder for me. Later, when I did see Christ, he was kind to me. I said, my Lord and my God. I knew he was Christ as soon as I saw him. He understood my weakness. He uses weakness and turns it into strength. He made me strong. I know you can be blessed by believing without seeing, but you can also be changed by seeing and believing. Tonight I gathered all my disciples together and wanted to share a last meal with them. I had grown to love them all. They were my closest friends and I was about to leave them. I'd spent three years with them. We shared many memories, but it was time for the scriptures to be fulfilled. You met them all tonight. Did you notice how special they all were? They all had their faults, but they also had great strengths. Well, tonight my ministry is about to end. God has a plan and it is about to be revealed. Tonight I want to serve my friends as they have served me. So I decided to wash their feet. Our roads are dusty, so whenever we would enter a room, a servant would wash our feet so that the experience would be more comfortable. If the cross wasn't the symbol of Christianity, then the basin and the towel should be. They're a great representation of service. Of course, I took the basin over and set it down in front of Peter. Peter always had strong feelings about everything, and tonight was no exception. I was ready to wash the feet of this big fisherman, and of course, he objected. I said, Peter, if you won't let me wash your feet, you can't be a part of my kingdom. Of course, he quickly changed his mind. I was trying to teach them all that by serving others, you would be serving God. This was the night, too, that I revealed that one of these friends would betray me. They were all stunned, except course for Judas. I knew he had made a deal with the soldiers and that his betrayal was near. Judas never did fully understand my ministry. He never latched on to his faith. I felt bad for him. He missed so many opportunities. Well, I know God chose these disciples wisely. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Thomas, Philip, Matthew, Bartholomew, James, the less, Simon, and Thaddeus. They all proved themselves as true disciples of the faith. 
I trust them to continue my ministry and to share it with a waiting world. They need to hear my words. They need to feel God's love. They need to serve others. I know these ordinary men will do a great job because with God working in their lives, they have become extraordinary. I will surely miss each and every one of them. And Judas, I hope he asks for forgiveness. Time will tell. Well, time to get back to this last supper with my friends. God's will be done. Amen.